Hey everyone, this is Jackie, and in this video, I'll be introducing us to the idea of systems thinking. Specifically, by the end of this video, you'll be able to define systems thinking and also define and identify characteristics of a system, including its components, boundaries, and processes. At some point in your chemistry education, you might ask yourself, how does organic chemistry influence biology? Or how does organic chemistry influence our economy and our society? Systems thinking is a way of thinking that emphasizes the interdependence of systems. With systems thinking, we can focus on the pieces that make up a system, but we can also focus on the interactions between systems, or the interactions within the system between the system's components. Here's an example of water that illustrates how you might apply systems thinking to chemistry. Let's start with a single molecule of water. Water is a polar compound. This property influences how it interacts with itself and other molecules, and also dictates macroscopic properties like its boiling point. Water treatment facilities may take advantage of water's boiling point to separate it from other molecules and filter off debris. The ability for water treatment facilities to take advantage of the chemical properties of water influences whether or not we have clean drinking water in our communities. Ensuring that people have clean drinking water is incredibly important for ensuring the health of individuals in our societies. This is especially important for children whose cognitive and physical development may be negatively impacted by compounds like lead in water. One key aspect that differentiates systems thinking from just learning chemistry in a real-world context is that systems thinking allows us to think about ways parts of our system might be influenced when we decide to make changes to other parts of our system or other systems. For example, what if you wanted to determine ways to ensure that everyone in your community received clean drinking water? What would need to happen economically, politically, scientifically, and socially for that to happen? As you can see, systems can start from something really small, but end up being about major issues we care about, like making sure everyone has access to clean drinking water. What we care about influences how we set boundaries for our systems, which we'll talk about in a few minutes in the coming slides of this video. But first, let's make sure we're on the same page so far. Which of the following best defines systems thinking in chemistry? A. Systems thinking is learning about chemistry within real-world contexts. B. Systems thinking focuses on the interdependence between chemistry components, as well as the influence of chemistry and chemical concepts on other systems. C. Systems thinking is a way of thinking about chemistry systematically. Not quite. Though systems thinking can be used to think about chemistry in real-world contexts, this definition doesn't describe ways that chemistry can be used to influence other systems. Correct. Systems thinking in chemistry can allow us to consider how chemical systems behave, how chemistry influences other systems, and also how other systems influence chemistry. Not quite. Remember, systems thinking is a way of thinking about chemistry as a system, and also as a system in relation to other systems, like environmental, biological, and social systems. Now that we've settled on a definition for systems thinking, let's dive into the different pieces that make up every system. In every system, there are going to be three primary parts, components, boundaries, and processes. We're going to learn about each of these in turn while using our water system as an example. Components are the elements of a system. For example, a component of ensuring that people in society are healthy are effective water treatment plants that treat unsanitary water. The processes of a system emerge from how the components interact with each other. Components of systems can have many different types of relationships, including non-intuitive ones. These interactions can result in the processes that serve as the functions of the system. For example, components of water treatment plants, such as the machines and the water itself, interact in ways to engage in the process of ensuring water is safe to consume. Systems thinking also allows us to consider the dynamic nature of these processes. What would happen to the water treatment process if its machinery was faulty, or if we introduced new contaminants into the water? Would the process of ensuring water is safe to consume be compromised? If so, how would you fix it? Solving these new challenges within your systems might require you to expand your boundaries. The boundaries of a system dictate what we consider a component or a process within that system. For example, if we were solely interested in how children were affected by unsanitary water, we could tighten our boundaries and focus our analysis solely on that part of the system. However, if instead we wanted to focus on the underlying causes for unsanitary water, we could instead expand the system by expanding its boundaries to include more components and more processes to better understand the underlying causes. We're now at the point where we can begin to practice building our own systems. I want you to pause the video and build a system based on the molecule ammonia, or NH3. Here's an expanded example to help you get started, so feel free to build off this one. Remember that the components, boundaries, and processes you decide on for the system are entirely up to you. All right, you can pause the video now and build your system, and when you're ready, you can unpause and we'll talk about specific components, boundaries, and processes within your systems. Awesome, now that you have your system created, I'm gonna ask you some questions to help you think more deeply about specific parts of your system. Feel free to pause the video between these questions if you need more time to think. What are the components of your system? What would happen to the system if certain components were removed? 
what processes are present in the system, and what would happen to the system if certain processes were removed. What boundaries have you implicitly created for the system? Can you expand your boundaries any further to include components or processes that are currently outside the boundaries of your system? Let's summarize what we did today. In this video, we learned about systems thinking and how it can be used to think about the relationships between chemistry and other systems, as well as the relationships within chemical systems. You then had the chance to build your own system about ammonia and critique your system's components, boundaries, and processes. If you want more practice with some of the ideas we talked about today, be sure to check out the problems linked in the description of this video. I'll see you next time.